This week on College Press Box, we address the Horns' first Big 12 loss of the season on the gridiron, national champions defending their title, and Rick Barnes' undefeated squad. All that and more on College Press Box. Welcome to College Press Box. I'm Corey Schneider, and that's Brad Kellner making his Press Box debut. The highly anticipated debut, might I add, uh, at least by me, maybe not by anyone else, but uh, I'm excited to be here, and we've got a jam-packed show for you guys tonight, so let's get right to it. The Horns lost their first Big 12 matchup of the year against OSU on Saturday with turn-up DKR, ending in a rather deflated and underpopulated stadium. Yeah, Corey, it was a tough loss, a disappointment for the Burnt Orange Faithful. Texas lost its first Big 12 conference game of the season. First overall loss since September 14th against Ole Miss. The Burnt Orange Faithful did not leave happy in this one, but uh, there were scores, which means we do have highlights. And like my future dog's name, here we go. Texas Longhorns taking on the Oklahoma State Cowboys in search of their seventh straight Big 12 win. Uh, Clint Shelf running up the middle on the first drive of the game for OSU, scrambling 18 yards for the score. Cowboys up 7 to nothing, just six minutes into the game. Still in the first quarter, Clint Shelf after the play action fake, looking deep down the right side. That one is intercepted by Michael Thompson in the end zone for a touchback. That would lead to an Anthony Farah field goal. In the second quarter, Clint Shelf with the option keeper takes it in from four yards out for the touchdown. OSU on top 14 to three midway through the second. Still in the second quarter, OSU up 14-3. Malcolm Brown up the middle, receiving a handoff from Case McCoy. Takes it seven yards for the touchdown. OSU on top, 14-10. Still in the second quarter, 14-10 the score. Clint Shelf, the pass to the right side. Intended for Tracy Moore. That is caught for a touchdown. 21-10, OSU on top late in the first half. Case McCoy looking uh, for Kendall Sanders. Intercepted by Justin Gilbert. Takes it 43 yards for a touchdown for the Oklahoma State Cowboys. 28 to 10, the score at the break. That was the dagger for UT. Now at halftime, a special moment. Jerry Gray receiving a plaque for being inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. And there he is, the man, the myth, the legend, Vince Young. In the third quarter, Case McCoy going deep down the left sideline. Intended for Mike Davis. That is caught a beautiful pitch and catch, trying to come back. The, later on the drive, Anthony Farah drills a 27-yard field goal, cutting the lead to 28 to 13. OSU still on top, five minutes into the third. Still in the third, however, Case McCoy looking across the middle, intercepted by Caleb Levy, returning at 23 yards for the Oklahoma State Cowboys, trying to put the Longhorns away. That would go on and set up the next play, Clint Shelf, after the play fake, looking left to Charlie Moore, who makes the catch in the end zone. OSU goes on top, 38-13, to with 154 left in the third. Still in the third, Texas trying to respond. Case McCoy looking for Kendall Sanders once again. And Justin Gilbert, there he is again, his second interception of the game. That guy's going to be playing on Sundays. That sealed the deal. McCoy's third pick of the day. OSU maintains control, winning by a final score of 38-13. to First Big 12 loss for Texas of the season. They fall to 7-3 on the year, 6-1 in conference play. Now, TSTV's own David Peritano, or as we like to call him, Carl Malone, was at the game and put together this glorious package. Texas went into Saturday afternoon's game thinking their defensive struggles were behind them, but the first half against Oklahoma State proved otherwise. This, that we didn't play, we didn't play well at all in the first half. We really didn't. We didn't play well, and uh, that team took advantage of it. And uh, uh, even in moments, there were some situations in the second half, but I thought we got control of things. But uh, I got to give them credit; they made their things good work. And we didn't react properly. Yeah, it, uh, we, we did a very poor job inside with gap control on the quarterback draw a couple of times early that just killed us. And then they squirted a run for about 20 yards with the same thing. Uh, we did a better job with that after that drive, but then they hurt us more on the option. And then we had three balls that we hit in the air that uh, on passes that they end up catching, especially one going through our hands in the end zone, and they catch it for a touchdown. So we just didn't make the plays, and they did. If the defensive struggles in the first half weren't enough for this Texas Longhorns team, Case McCoy had one of the worst performances of the entire season, leaving coaches disappointed and confused. I mean, quarterback goes out and throws three picks, you're not going to win a ball game. This is just very rare that happens. So it's on me. My team knows it's on me. We're going to get it fixed and we'll go win. 
Um, you know, obviously he didn't play his best game, but um, we've seen him come out this year and, and, and play incredible. So, um, you know, I think that we all know that he has the potential to play really well, and today just wasn't the greatest day for him. But, you know, we're all still confident in him, and we are back, we're back behind him 100%. With the Big 12 championship still within their grasp, the Longhorns hope to right their ship on Thanksgiving against the Red Raiders of Texas Tech. So uh, there's a lot of football to be played. And you, you just can't get your head down. You can't lay down and quit when you have a bad night. you got to go back to work. David Peritano, College Press Box. To further educate you on UT football, we bring in five-star analyst recruit, Peter Splendorio. Peter, what can you take away from this game? Why did we not come out on top? Guys, what I think inhibited the Longhorns in this game was the fact that they really weren't able to come back from uh, an early deficit. I thought it was going to be important for them to stick with the Cowboys. We've seen OSU score a lot on, the, on, uh, on offense this year, also have a really good defense. They were 20th ranked coming into this game. They showed that, intercepting Case McCoy three times. And when the Longhorns went down 28 to 10 at halftime, the game was thoroughly in hand. Uh, the Longhorns had a chance to go into the locker room 14 to 10. Uh, of course, they weren't able to do that. Uh, the missed interception by Adrian Phillips and then the pick six by Justin Gilbert against Case McCoy kind of sealed things for the Longhorns. I thought they had a chance to, to really cause some trouble for this OSU team being at home in front of a, a crowd that should have been rowdier based on the turn up DKR promotion. But they weren't able to do it because of the turnovers. Now, I mean, this is the first time the Longhorns this season have lost the turnover battle. They lost it 3-1. to one. Uh, Not coincidentally, they're 0-1 in those games that they've lost the turnover battle. I think that that was really the problem. They gave OSU too many opportunities to take advantage of turnovers. And, and quite frankly, in doing that, they gave OSU the game. So how can the Longhorns bounce back from this loss? I mean, after losing the turnover battle, how can they bounce back and beat Texas Tech at home on Thanksgiving night? Well, I think it's going to start on offense getting back to what they were doing during the win streak that made them successful, and that's running the ball. Uh, of course, they had a lot of rushing attempts, but they only averaged three and a half rushing yards per carry. I think it's a big loss for them to lose Jonathan Gray. He's a guy that was getting a lot of yardage on first and second down, bouncing outside the tackles. Now they just have two short yardage backs in Joe Bergeron and Malcolm Brown. Malcolm Brown only had 2.9 yards per carry in his first game as the premier back. I think it's going to be important for the Longhorns to get more on first down and second down from these two running backs, open things up more for Case McCoy and give him more manageable throws. He kind of seemed to force things a little bit in this game. The two interceptions to Gilbert were really the product of him trying to force passes that weren't there. If they can limit, limit the mistakes, win the turnover battle, and run the ball better, I think we'll see a better performance against Texas Tech on Thanksgiving. So looking forward uh, to Texas Tech, looking past them, and looking to Baylor, what do you expect from this game and a possible bowl appearance from the Texas Longhorns? Well, I think the Texas will be favored in this Texas Tech game coming up. Of course, the Red Raiders started 7-0, and but they've lost four in a row since then. Texas hasn't lost two. Texas Tech in four years. I expect them to extend that streak this week, uh, I guess whenever they take them on on Thanksgiving. I think Baylor is going to be too tough. They're scoring at will. They've scored over 60 points in six games this year. I think it's realistic to expect Texas to finish second or third in this conference, maybe with the ceiling being the Cotton Bowl. Well, Peter Spindorio, always earning his scholarship. Coming up on College Press Box, we discuss more of Longhorn sports in this week and the future. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to what some call the best Monday night sports show at TSTV. It's got to be top three. Speaking of the best, the UT volleyball team continues to defend its 2012 title, extending their win streak to 15 matches after sweeping Texas Tech in Lubbock Saturday. All-Americans Haley Eckerman and Bailey Webster continue to lead the explosive UT attack. Eckerman had 12 kills in the victory, and Webster had 10. Cat Bell matched her season high with eight blocks. Texas finishes their regular season with three or four matches at home, starting with a Thursday night matchup against West Virginia and a Saturday competition against K-State, both at Gregory. Staying on the hardwood, hardwood but changing sports, after a three-point win over Mercer to begin the season, the Texas Longhorn men's basketball team was back at it last Tuesday night as the Horns hosted the South Alabama Jaguars. Here are the highlights from Game 2 of the 2013 season. And here come the Longhorns running out on the floor, facing South Alabama in Game 2 of the season. In the first half, first possession of the game for UT, DeMarcus Holland hits the floater in the lane, giving Texas a 2-0 lead. Now a couple minutes later, South Alabama leading 4-2, bringing the ball up the floor. A nice pass to Augustine Rubit, who hits the jumper. South Alabama on top 6-2. To 
Now on the other end, Javon Felix hits the nice quick left-handed layup, cutting the score to eight, 18 to 10. South Alabama led, but on the ensuing possession, Antoine Allen hits the big three, Rubit with the find. South Alabama led 45-31 at the half. Connor Lambert, though, beginning the second half in style, a big three, cutting the deficit to four points. 11 minutes to go, a nice block by Jonathan Holmes, a huge stuff up ahead, Javon Felix finding Demarcus Holland, who hits the trailer. Jonathan Holmes, who drills the three, cutting the deficit back to seven points. Texas making a big comeback in this one with 4.10 left to go. Isaiah Taylor, the nice right-handed layup uh, to Marcus Holland on the assist. Texas led 73-72 to at that point. Went on to win by a final of 84-77. to UT continued their undefeated season Friday night, defeating Stephen F. Austin 72-62. to Demarcus Holland had a team-high 21 points with four other Longhorns joining him in double digits. Utility reporter Tierra Newbaum was at the Frank Irwin Center for UT's third victory. Got to hear what Rick Barnes and his team had to say about the win. We started out we, from the very first play we didn't execute. And uh, we've done a poor job on the three-point line, obviously, where I don't think our guys understand that you might have to defend four or five feet and outside that. We came out this game uh, on fire. I think we've, what we've done well in the past few games is, is finished well uh, with, that, with that lineup out on the court. Uh, the last four minutes, we uh, were really able to, to just hold on to the ball, make free throws, um, execute, uh, and, and get stops and rebounds. So. Texas almost doubled their field goal percentage in the second half. DeMarcus Holland with a career high of 21 points. Coach Rick Barnes said that DeMarcus has been the most valuable player for this team during the start of the season. He also said that any coach in the country would want Holland on their team. DeMarcus has always taken it on personally and you look at him tonight, uh, he went in there tonight looking to pass a couple times and uh, that's where he's really improved and uh, but defensively he just affects everything and, and, and when he takes himself out of the game like he did tonight for just a minute or so, that tells you how hard he plays. But, He's a winner, and, and you love you just love what he's about. He, he just keeps throwing up the stat sheet. He does all the little things. He plays harder than anybody on the team. He and, he and John, I mean, they play hard. Yeah, I, I think it's good for us to have games like this, so uh, we we can show that we have fight in us and uh, and know how to deal with adversity. And uh, I think we've been doing a good job of sticking together and, and pulling out wins. <laughs> Brad, UT is currently on pace to win every game this season. Should UT fans get their hopes up? Uh, for an undefeated season, I would say no, no chance. While Texas does have a better record than Duke and Kentucky at the moment, it's not going to last for very long. This team is very young, but they have been playing very well. But the three wins are against some inexperienced non-conference opponents. Well, what have they been doing right, and what, what can they improve on? Well, it's, it's a very young and inexperienced team, and they've been playing with a lot of fight and a lot of heart. I've been very impressed. Three comeback wins. Texas has trailed by seven points, at least seven points, in all three of its victories so far. Now, Texas is going to have a tough task getting back to the NCAA tournament. Only two upperclassmen on Rick Barnes's roster this year. The top four returning scores, excuse me, top four leading scores from last season did not return. Three Texas Longhorns have led the team in scoring in the first three games of the year. So a lot of contributions from a lot of different players. Now what this team needs to improve on is defending the three and moving without the ball on offense. Texas has allowed 10 three-pointers, at least 10 three-pointers, in all three of its games this season. And they've gone prolonged periods without scoring on offense because guys are just simply not moving without the ball. All right, we'll have to see how that plays out. Let's get to some women's hoops. The Texas Longhorns women's basketball team hosted its neighbors from San Marcos last Wednesday night when the Texas State Bobcats came to town. The highlights, you ask? Production, in the words of Chris Brown, run it. The Texas women's basketball team running out onto the court. Some nice dance moves. Ooh. Hosting the Texas State Bobcats 13-7 early in the game. A nice steal by Nick and, and Pauly. Another steal, all kinds of craziness going on, but Empress Davenport ends up hitting the lane, giving Texas a 15-7 lead. That one counted, and the foul. Now, Crystal Henderson finding Chas Fassell, who takes one dribble around the screen and hits the three. Bang! UT up 20-12. Now, a few minutes later for the Longhorns, Texas on top by 15, 35-20 already in this one. Selena Rodrigo hits the jumper in the lane. Texas up by 17 points. 37 to 20. Now there's Jackson Jeffcoat, the Texas defensive end. His sister actually plays for Texas State. 
And for Stanport misses the three, but Enem Pauly with the rebound and scores for the Horns, making it 63-34 to in favor of Texas. With just over six minutes to go in the game, Texas on top by 41, cruising to a win. Nice pass from Henderson to Monty McGee. Stafford who hits the bucket. Texas goes up 83-40, and the Horns go on to win by a final score of 96-42 to over the Texas State Bobcats. The Longhorns travel to Albuquerque, New Mexico to take on the Lady Lobos tomorrow night and then they host 6th ranked Stanford at the Irwin Center on Saturday. Coming up next on College Press Box, we'll take a look at some other Big 12 conference football games that didn't involve the Texas Longhorns. We're going to preview maybe the biggest Big 12 game that we not involved in UT. Don't go away. It's College Press Box. The Big 12, or 10, depending on how you learn to count, had some big games this weekend, and luckily we have the man himself back to tell us what happened and what it means from Texas. We'll start in the bottom half of the Big 12. Yeah, the Kansas Jayhawks won a game in the Big 12. Let that sink in for a minute. A 27-game conference losing streak snapped. Kansas's last win actually took place in 2010 against the Colorado Buffaloes. Yes, the same Buffaloes who have been in the Pac-12 for the last two years. The Jayhawks rushed for 315 yards as a team and officially eliminated West Virginia from bowl eligibility with the win. KU picked up its third victory of the year. West Virginia falls to 4-7. and seven. Now, Peter, I ask you, what are your thoughts on the milestone win for this Kansas program that actually won a BCS Bowl just five years ago? I mean, yeah, that is pretty remarkable they won a BCS game five years ago. Uh, I think what, what we should really take away from it is just congratulations to Kansas. They finally snapped that ugly three-year streak of ineptitude. And it's Charlie Weiss's first win in a conference game as a head coach. Of course, he spent five years with Notre Dame. There is no conference for Notre Dame. Now in his second year with Kansas, he gets that win. Charlie Weiss has officially won a conference game, and now Kansas, State, now Kansas has officially won a conference game in the last three years. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to see how these teams can transfer over just a period of five years. 2005, 2009, Kansas and Texas were so much noticeably better than they are now, but it's really interesting to see how, how things change. And staying at the bottom of the Big 12, K-State beat TCU on a last second field goal. But although they are still remaining at the bottom half of the Big 12, so I ask you, what does this mean for Texas? Well, I don't think it will mean anything in the long run, but technically it could mean something. Uh, Kansas State is four and three now in conference play. One win behind Texas. Now, of course, Texas does have the tiebreaker beating Kansas State in their first conference game to start the year. But should Texas lose their next two games, and if Kansas State wins their next two, that would put Kansas State ahead of Texas and would likely mean the Longhorns finished in fifth place of the conference. That's not where they want to finish. Uh, of course, winning their first six conference games of the year, it's pretty remarkable. They won six games in a row, and there's still the possibility of them finishing as low as fifth. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Texas will be able to win another game. Kansas State still has a game against Oklahoma next week, but it's still pretty crazy to think that that could happen. Yeah, I completely agree. I, don't, I almost don't even want to think about that. Hopefully the, this game doesn't matter. Texas beat Kansas State and TCU both earlier in the year, so hopefully Texas stays on top of both of those teams. All right, transitioning to the last Big 12 game, the biggest Big 12 game outside of Austin this weekend. Baylor put its 12-game winning streak and undefeated record on the line against Texas Tech at Jerry World in Arlington, Texas last Saturday night. After trailing by double digits for the first time all season, the fifth-ranked Baylor Bears went on to roll the Red Raiders by the final score of 63-34. to Now, Baylor put up 63 points without its two top leading rushers and top receiver this season. So, Peter, I ask you, how good is this Baylor offense, and can anyone stop these guys? Guys, this Baylor offense is really good, and quite frankly, I have seen nothing to make me think that somebody can stop them. I mean, it's somebody different every week scoring a lot of points or getting a lot of yards for them. Like you said, they're without their top two rushers. Uh, but it's somebody different every week, whether it's Seastrong, Linwood, Goodley. I mean, this team is just filled with talent, filled with athleticism, and filled with people that quite, lengthy, quite frankly can move the ball down the field. I think this Baylor team has an has a outside chance of getting to the national championship based on things happening in front of it. But I don't see them losing a game before bowl season begins. They're first in points scored, third in passing, and ninth in rushing. They're also seventh in defense. That's an underrated aspect of their game. But this could be the first team to ever rush for more than 300 yards and pass for more, more than 300 yards on average in one season. I think Baylor looks unstoppable right now. 
Staying on the note of Baylor, the top two teams meet in Stillwater Saturday night for what could determine the Big 12 Conference title. Yeah, it's a very big game in Stillwater this Saturday night. Both of these teams actually do control their own destiny, so if they win out, they will be Big 12 champions and receive that coveted automatic BCS Bowl berth. I'm really anxious and excited to see this game. I mean, Peter just talked about the high-powered Baylor offense. They're going up against the Oklahoma State Cowboy defense that actually leads the conference in takeaways. So I'm looking forward to a very, very good game on Saturday in Stillwater. All right, well, that's all we have for this segment. Peter, thanks for being around. Coming up, we have this week in Longhorn Sports and the track team staying busy in the offseason, all that and more. Stay right here, College Press Box. <laughs> Backstreet's back. All right. The NCAA South Central Regional Cross Country Meet took place last Friday in Waco, Texas. Texas senior Mario Hall repeated as regional champion, and the Longhorn men placed second as a team to punch their tickets to the NCAA championships this weekend. Hall finished the 6,000-meter run in 19 minutes and 40 seconds, 24 seconds better than the second-place finisher. All seven men's runners finished in the top 25, and four finished inside the top 10. The next meet, the NCAA Championships, will take place this Saturday in Indiana. Former UT women's track coach Bev Kearney has filed a million-dollar lawsuit against the university on Thursday. She claims that the school displayed race and gender discrimination and retaliation. Kearney coached at Texas from 1993 until January when she resigned after learning Texas was preparing to fire her for an inappropriate relationship with one of her athletes in 2002. UT and A&M may not be in the same conference anymore, but that doesn't mean the rivalry has to go away. The two schools, student government and rec sports staff, have been working to bring the Lone Star Challenge back, but this time it's between intramural competition. The intramural flag football winners of both schools met yesterday to take a best two out of three competition and a new tradition between the two schools. Our own Bailey Zara Pavaro was there with more. It all came down to three seconds. Texas senior kicker Justin Tucker hit a 40 yard field goal to end a rivalry that spanned more than a century between the University of Texas and Texas A&M. I just want to renew that rivalry. Students at both universities want to renew the rivalry. It's really cool to see all the burn around here and the burnt orange and people yelling and doing Texas fight and you know, A&M doing their little traditions. That's really cool. We haven't had that for quite some time. The teams met at Clark Field just beyond the shadows of Daryl K. Royal. But players from both schools felt differently than they did nearly two years ago when the burnt orange took on the maroon. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we don't get to play those guys in the real thing anymore, but it's fun to get out here and compete against them and then student stuff really fun. it was really cool I haven't been to this is my first time to be in Austin ever and so um, it was it was really cool I really like the city of Austin and it was just fun to be able to come here and like kind of renew the rivalry I guess a little bit uh, it was a lot of fun uh, we don't get to rep the burn orange necessarily day in day out we get to rep our uh, Eagles blue but burn orange is always fun especially against those Aggies and whether they wore burnt orange or maroon all Texans agreed they wanted to see the rivalry renewed on a bigger stage like DKR and Kyle Field. I want it to happen like next year, but I mean, or maybe, maybe we can play a bowl game or something, but I mean, I would like to have it happen again. It's definitely a lot of fun. Uh, we should play the real game again. Bailey Zarpavar, College Press Box. Longhorn's staying busy this week. In fact, we have a lot going on this week. Yeah, we do. On Tuesday night, tomorrow, the women's basketball team travels to Albuquerque to take on the New Mexico Lady Lobos at 8 p.m. And Thursday night, volleyball plays West Virginia try to remain undefeated in the Big 12. And this weekend, Thursday to Saturday, the men and women's swimming and diving teams host the UT Diving Invitational here in Austin. And Saturday, we have the track and field championships. We have women's basketball versus Six Rake Stanford and volleyball versus K-State in and, the afternoon. And finally, next Monday night, men's basketball takes on BYU at a neutral site as part of the CBE Hall of Fame Classic. That game's at 6.30 on ESPNU. The Texas Longhorns have a date with bye this week that I think they should be able to win. Since UT doesn't play a real game, we're going to preview and predict the Fourth-ranked Baylor Bears matchup against the 10th-ranked Oklahoma State Cowboys. Corey, I ask you, who do you have in this matchup in Stillwater? Well, I think it's pretty fair to take the Baylor Bears. Their offense is absolutely ridiculous, 61.2 points per game. 
I don't see how he can possibly compensate. Oklahoma, it does have the 14th best offense. That's not enough to overcome the deficit that Bryce Petty's offense will provide for them. Yeah, so. yeah I'm going to go ahead and take Baylor as well, but I think it's going to be a lot closer than you and a lot of other people expect. I think it's going to be 42 to 31, the final. Baylor's offense is very, very good, but the game in Oklahoma State, anything can happen on the road. I think the Cowboys actually will have a lead at some point in the first half, but Baylor's just too strong on both sides of the ball. As Peter mentioned it earlier in this show, their defense doesn't get talked about a lot, but it is been very good for Baylor all year long. See, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take the Baylor Bears. Their magical undefeated ride stays alive in Stillwater this weekend. And we'll have to see how Baylor fares against Texas. Last game of the season, as we said. Well, that's all we have for this week. I'm Corey Schneider. And I'm Brad Kellner. And deuces. Adios.